Yes, yes. Seven eleven, there's two more minutes left. Right? Make sure the name is uh, Yeah, but there's less than a minute left. What are you going to do? With this? Uh, one more minute left. Um, it's 7.13, it's time. Could you pass the scripts, please? Stop writing. Um. <coughs> Could you pass the scripts down the aisles and start to continue with this? <coughs> now, for, the, for those of you that, I mean, you probably have noticed, this was a question that um, I think I asked some of you guys. Uh, we, well, I, I asked everybody in class, actually. Hey, man, it's 2D, right? Um, so the people that... This question, you were there. You were one of the people that actually remained with one of my whiteboard markers. Yes, John? Yeah? Could you pass down the scripts? But everybody saw the question. Yes, what is the problem? You thought they were what? The 16. Yeah. Firstly, I thought it was a number. Then I had to rub. Then that's when I discovered to say it's a base. Okay. Tough like passed on this. That's unfortunate. <clears throat> Pass the scripts. Well, that's unfortunate. Pass them down, please. Pass them down. But keep them all if you want. What, what do you do with them? Keep them. They're yours. <laughs> Could you pass them down, please? Pass them down the aisle. Doesn't matter. I mean, if I notice, if we notice that, uh, if, if we not, shh, please. Now we have to shh now like we are in kindergarten. If we notice that uh, a lot of people made the same mistake, we just follow the process. If you thought this was uh, A16 and that was uh, D216, fine, we shall follow the process and see if you did the. Could you pass? pass? All right. Um, Okay. So we continue our discussion with, um, with, with, um, we continue our discussion of you know data encoding or data representation. Um, uh, but before we we continue from where we left, um, which was images, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, thank you. I just wanted to say a few things, right? Um, just a few announcements here. You know, I, 
I don't know what's going on here. I'm struggling to understand what's so hard when it comes to following the rules. Simple rules, right? Very basic rules. Things that don't require a lot of thinking, right? Communication. We say this. We've said this. We've been singing about this for, I don't know how many times we've mentioned this anyway, but we've said that communication is only via email, right? Now, Master Usari, the other day, he sends us an email. It's like someone is asking for your number. Get my number if you want to, but I will not respond to your calls or your SMSs because the details of how we communicate are in the course syllabus. We say it's via email or via the Moodle. If you haven't figured out how to use those two communication channels, then tough luck, right? There's nothing I can do to help you with that. Um, if you, are, you have trouble with email, if you don't know how to send an email, what you do is you come and see us during office hours. Every Friday, between 9 and 13, the door is always open. If I'm not around, obviously, I'll send email to let you know that I'm not going to be around. I'm always there, waiting. So if you want to come and see me over something and you cannot, you're incapable of sending email or logging onto the Moodle to send a message, come and see us. Physically walk up to the fifth floor and come and see us. It's simple, right? No phone calls, no SMSs, no WhatsApp. Nobody's going to respond to you. And also, on the email, we said it's UNSA assigned email addresses. Now, somebody emailed me yesterday. Yes, I have not responded to you because you know why. In fact, you wrote in your message that I, I, I'm sorry, I did not use my user assigned emails. And I looked at that and I'm like, okay, fine. I just assumed it was, uh, and in fact, I don't even know if that person is from here, by the way, because I teach other courses as it turns out, right? This is one of the reasons why we need you to use the user assigned email so that we know who you are. But, but I guess there was mention of the quiz, so it's from, from here. So I will not respond to that email. If you still want to come and see me, come and see me between 9 and 13, because you don't know how to send emails using your own assigned email address. Sorry about that. Um, I can't help. Uh, but I can't teach you how to send an email using the UNSA assigned email address. Also, on the assessments. Now, when I mentioned, when I reminded you that there are consequences to some of these things we're doing, uh, the pe people came out of the woodwork, right? Oh, no, I was unable to send the assignment because of Moodle. Well, if you had a problem, why is it that 48 people in class managed to do it? If you notice that you've had a problem with Moodle, what have you been waiting for? Why have you not had it fixed? I don't solve Moodle problems. Why? Because I don't have admin access to Moodle. You know, everybody in here knows that when you have a Moodle problem, you go to CICT. If you don't know who to approach or where to go to CICT, Use, I don't know if you have a WhatsApp group, ask your colleagues, right? There are people that have had problems and know exactly where to go um, when they need a Moodle problem or an email problem resolved. You know, so I'm not going to take that as an excuse for, oh, I didn't submit uh, the assignments because I had problems with Moodle. Really? You're lying, right? Um, now, I don't know if I was dreaming. I, I, I reached out to you the other time. I told you to say the lab is almost always empty. If you don't have a computer, tell me so that we tell the people to have the lab open when you want to go in there. Nobody has come forward, right? Uh, these characters the other day, is it the day before yesterday, say, oh, I was unable to submit because I don't have a computer. I went home and I don't have a computer. I'm like, the lab is there, right? It's not just the Odell laboratory, actually. The, 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 the library basement computer laboratory is meant to be used for exactly this purpose. So, so I, I won't take that as an excuse. If you're unable to submit uh, the assessments because you had no access to a computer, then tough luck, right? It's, it's sad, really. Um, tied to this, right? This, this other person is like, oh, no, I, I couldn't send. So somebody else was, sending, well, was submitting the assignment on my behalf. When are you going to learn this if you're giving or if you're using your friends? to do the work for you. When? When are you going to learn? I don't know. OK, um, I'm done my rant. I don't know if there are questions. Are there any questions with you guys? No, no questions. So where we left off, right? There's a bit of a, a mishap here. Yeah, we have, we have to rant sometimes. And again, I'll remind you, these things that you're doing have consequences. If you neglect assessments, there's a high likelihood that you will fail the course. You will. And the, the most harrowing fact really is that 
there are people that are repeating a course here that did not bother to submit the take home quizzes. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what the hell are you thinking, right? What are you trying to do to yourself, really? You failed the course last year, you're repeating the course, and then you're neglecting assessments that are literally easy marks, right? These are easy marks, throw away marks. You have 24, well, I guess you had 48 hours, well, a little less than 48 hours, to, to work through something that you'd have otherwise work through in 11 minutes. And what do you do? You decide not to bother to submit it. You see, the, the way this machine works, right, the machine called the UNSA is, it's so objective that they don't really care so much. If you don't work hard, you can fail even 10 times now, apparently. So you keep on repeating this course until you pass it. So if, if you are thinking that, oh, because I failed that course last year, then nah, maybe I'll pass this course just because, no. You only pass if you put in the work. Okay, so that's it for the rant. I'm sorry I had to take you back. Uh, so on, was that Wednesday or something? Uh, I, was, I was trying to do like a live demo and it didn't really work, it wasn't that clear. So what I did was I got some screen grabs to try and uh, kind of showcase this thing I was talking about, the issue of raw image files. Um, so these screenshots really are showing you um, the process I go through on my mobile device, right? So it, it might not be the same as, as the device that you have, just because I'm using, uh, I guess, a different version of Android from what maybe people might be using. Um, and also the camera apps tend to be different, right? So this is specific to OnePlus 3T, right? The camera version 3.0.30, actually, not dot, not dot, dot three dot zero dot thirty. Um, so what I do when I want to take raw image um, files is I have to explicitly configure the application. Um, so I go to the settings and then I, I, I activate pro mode, what they call professional mode. Um, and then once I do that, the a whole bunch of options that come up on top there. And what I do is I, I click the raw option and then just specify that I want to take raw images and then I take the image, right? Um, and you notice that once I take the image, if I, if I use um, either the built-in file, file, file explorer or file manager um, or a custom one like this one, this is Astro, I get to see the raw image file, right? The digital negative DNG file. So this is what I was trying to show last time when the demo kind of like failed. And, and you really notice that, so these two images were, were taken within a space of, I guess, they were five seconds apart or something, so you notice that the sizes are somewhat different, it's like five megabytes instead of one megabyte because it's a raw image, right? Um, so again, like I said, typically if you take a raw image file, you won't be able to open it using your default application on your phone. So you can't use the camera. So I cannot open this uh, raw image using the uh, camera application on my phone. I have to use a computer application software that is able to open this sort of file. So that's able to sort of like read this file format. Right, so in this case, I'm, I'm just using GIMP. I happen to use GIMP because it's freely available and it's open source, right? So you just go out there and download it and use it. In fact, it's available for kind of like various um, operating systems, so you can download the Windows equivalent if you wish to. But interestingly enough, GIMP in its vanilla format is unable to, to open the DNG file. So what I have to do, what you have to do is you have to install a plugin, right, it's just a type of uh, application software. So there's a GIMP plugin called Raw Photo Loader in this case, which I had to, um, to install. Um, and then, yeah, I'm able to open the, the, the raw image file, the digital negative, and then once I open it, GIMP also has an option to export the image into various formats, depending on what I want to use the resulting format for. So if I'm, if I'm sharing it with other people, I can't share 31 megabytes of the file, right, of photo. In fact, it, it would mean the people that I'm sending that digital negative to must know exactly what sort of application to use to open the digital negative. So um, the best option here is to convert it into an image file format that is able to be read by the vast majority of people. If I'm using this uh, resource on the web, for instance, um, I would probably have to convert it to the format that is substantially smaller in size. PNG, for instance. Right. So hopefully that makes sense. I thought I'd mention it just because I, I, I think it didn't really make that, mess, that much sense on, on, um, on Wednesday. Oh, and these are much clearer now. So black and white, classic black and white, and then grayscale, and then 
true color there. All right, and, and so hopefully that calculation now will make sense as you are doing those calculations. Um, remember that if, if you're interested in calculating the theoretical size of the image, remember that the answer that you will get here is not going to match with the average file size indicated by the operating system. Why? Because typically, in fact, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the file that you are working with, the image file you are working with, has already been compressed. Right? Um, and also, when you calculate the theoretical size, you notice that the size that you calculate is somewhat smaller than the, 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 the size reported by the operating system. We mentioned that the digital na native also has descriptive information about the image itself the metadata, so it's stored as part of that same file, which is why you have extra, um, uh, an extra size, or extra bits to the original uh, uh, bits representing the photo. Uh, and depending on the f uh, format you're using, like for JPEG, for instance, approximately 16% apparently is used for the metadata. Right? So 16% of the original bits representing the image would be the size for the metadata, and then the, the total of the theoretical image size and the Metadata will give you the total size of the image that you'd expect, right? Hopefully this makes sense. Um, yeah. So again, just talking about compression here. Okay, so then the, the question is, how, how exactly do we encode video, right? It turns out that video is nothing more than a combination of um, images and sound, right? But the interesting thing about the images is that they're presented to you in rapid succession. Um, and the rapid succession at which the image is presented to you or to us is defined by the number of frames per second. Um, typically when you're taking video footage of uh, a scenery or a scene, um, your camera has a default frame per second value that it uses. Right? These are the standard sizes currently in use, so you see that it's like 25 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Right? What this means is that uh, in any given second, there are 30 images that are, that, that are being uh, sort of like rendered onto the screen. Right, so in any given second, one, two, like 30 images, and then you, you perceive those um, successive 30 images as being motion picture, right? Like it's a movie or something, it's not, right? It's just images. Um, <clears throat> Just trying to showcase the, the, the things or the values that you'd see if you're trying to look at um, descriptive information about the video, like in this case, these are different video formats um, corresponding to the same video, which is this, by the way, the, the bio setting demonstration. And you notice that all of them are, um, are actually encoded using 30 frames per second, all the different formats here. And incidentally, they're the same because I just downloaded them from YouTube, right? So I went to YouTube, I uploaded this to YouTube, initially in 4K, um, and then went downloading it because YouTube, the, the people that, you know, uh, sort of like wrote the code for YouTube, realized, or YouTube has realized that there are potentially different uses for something like this, right? Uh, I might want to view this video footage in a, low constraint environment where bandwidth is extremely slow, right? Internet connection is slow. So I cannot, I, I cannot hope to view an image in 4K, why? Because it's going to take a very long time for you to completely download the image, right? Which is why when you upload a video to YouTube, YouTube will convert it to various formats, right? And, uh, so these are the formats that I downloaded, this is what we're seeing here. But all of them are using 30 frames per second, the only difference is the resolution here. Right, which is the number here, and we'll talk about it just now. Uh, so still on the, this, yes? So, um, the 30, I mean 25 and 25 frames per second. 25 and 30. Yes, are they the same ones, like, let's say when you open YouTube, right? It gives you that provision where you put the quality that you're supposed to be. No, no, that's a resolution. No, that's a resolution. Those are, that has nothing to do with the number of frames per second. The, the resolution is similar to what we're describing for images where it, the resolution corresponds to the number of pixels that, you're going, that, that are going to be associated with, um, with the video. We'll talk about resolution just now. So this is what you're talking about here. You see, when you see a, 
of course this is not very clear, but there's a 720p somewhere here, 480p, uh, 320p, 144p, right? Um, they correspond, oh, the p's are here, 144p, 240p, 360p, 480p, these correspond to the resolution, right? Um, so it has nothing to do with the number of frames per second. And because this corresponds to, to the resolution, it's telling you to say, if you're using, um, if you're using 144, 144K, 144p, for instance, it's telling you to say the horizontal number of pixels are going to be what? 144. Right, and, and because the average, these days the average video uses an aspect ratio of uh, uh, 16 to nine, right? Uh, you can easily compute what the, what the resulting width is going to be. Right, I don't know if you're making sense. So 144p means that it's going to be a 256 by 144 resolution. Meaning that the image, if you, if you go to YouTube and you, you decide explicitly, say I want to view and uh, I want to view this video using 144p. I, I don't know who would want to do that because it's terrible, right? The quality is terrible. But there are reasons for that anyway, why you might want to do that. What that means is that the number of pixels that are going to be rendered onto your screen are going to be 256 times 144. Remember the number is going to result into the like the total number of pixels that you have being, being rendered here. And you know, sorry? Yes. So, but why would you pick less if your, if your speed is like... Why, why would you pick less? Yes. Because the, it turns out that the number of pixels dictate the size. We calculated the size of... Yep, yeah, the number of pixels dictate the size, right? So if you, if you pick a, a lesser resolution, it means you're going to be using less bundles. What does that mean? When you're using less bundles, less money. If you're, if you're using like uh, bundles from MTN, right? Um, in fact, also, it means less time to watch the video because it turns out that it, it, there's time, there's latency being, I mean, you have to take into account the latency between uh, initiation of, you know, I want to watch this video and then the data being transmitted to you. If there's more data being transmitted to you from the other side, it means it's going to take a long period of time to get to you. So you'll be there waiting for the video to load. And I'm sure you've come across this here on YouTube, right? You see the, the, the kind of like progress bar. It's the, it's buffering, yeah? So these are different, so it's a, it's a choice you have to make, right? Is cost more important to you? Is the quality more important for you? Like, do you want the video to be so clear, right? I don't know why you'd want that. Well, I do anyway. Yes, sir? On the points, where you said, uh, is it going to convert to 30 frames per second? Yes. That's like a normal average, they say. Now what happens when you are trying to shoot a small motion video, a fast motion video? Does the number of uh, claims increase as shooting a slow motion? I, I honestly don't know. That's something we would have to look at. I don't know. I don't know how slow motion would be linked to this. I don't know if it, it, it means far less, uh, I think it probably means far less, far, far less, I don't know if it means far less frames. I think it does mean far less frames, but I don't know. We should look into this, right? I think that would be nice. The question is, you know when you shoot, there's a, there's a configuration setting on your, on your phone, for instance, where you can take video footage in slow motion. So it's trying to understand what the link is between the number of frames, the FPS, and, um, and, and the, the way slow motion works. I don't know. We can research on that. We shall research on that. I don't know. Okay, so, uh, there we go. These are things we should understand because now you know that when you go to, to YouTube and you're using bundles or replication, some of these things. But back to the frames per second thing here. I thought it would be interesting to use the same example, this video that I got, to show you that, um, that in fact, there, there are actually just multiple images being presented. So what I did was I extracted this, this, this video, by the way, is one minute and 39 seconds in size, I mean, in length, right? Yeah, if those of you that have watched this know it's one minute, 39 seconds. So what I did was I extracted all the frames associated with this video footage. And you realize that you can compute the theoretical number of frames by taking into account the time. 
if we are saying every, if, if we are saying this video is shot using 30 FPS, then what that means is that uh, in every second, you have 30 images, right? Hmm? If, if every image has 30 images, then all you have to do is convert the one minute into seconds, obviously, which is 60, so 60 plus 39 times 30 will give you the total number of image frames associated with this thing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying all of these things because you want to experiment with these things if you want to understand what's going on. Right? So go out there and extract the frames for whatever video footage you might be watching at that point in time and see the resulting number of images. So, a one minute 39 seconds long video footage has roughly 2,970 frames associated with it. And these are the ones here, actually. They're actually, they are indeed 200 and, uh, I guess people are wondering, I think I put them somewhere here. It's not gonna be a live demo, don't worry. Um, do you understand this? So I'm gonna to go to video encoding and I'm gonna go into FPMS. So these are the different frames that are associated with this, um, with this, uh, with, with this particular uh, video that I uploaded onto YouTube, the demonstration of the BIOS, how the BIOS works. How cool is that, right? So, yeah? So you can view that as a single image. Yeah, if you, well, yes. You want us to do that? It's nice to not just talk about these things, but to actually see what's happening. Uh, so I'll, 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 use, I'll use Dolphin, which is a file explorer, right? And then I'll start viewing them one at a time. So this is the first, I'll use Dolphin and then I'll open it using Gwen View. So this is the first, and I hope this will work. This is the first frame, right? Zero, 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 0001. This garbage is not working. First frame, yeah? Yeah, the one minute, 39 second long video has 2,700, about 2,970 frames. Yes, pictures. The pictures that are making up the, the, the thing, the video, right? So if, I, if we start, have you noticed that they're moving, right? You, can, you probably can't see here on top here, the number here, yeah? This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and, and in fact, if I, if I start doing it in rapid succession, notice that, and I'm not doing it kind of like fast enough the way video works, but if I start doing it fast enough, you notice that we're simulating what would happen to, um, to the so-called videos we are watching, right? This is what happens, this is how video is encoded. But of course, it's not as simplistic as how we are making it seem here because we have to encode sound as well as part of the video. Not only that, right, if you were to kind of like figure out the total size of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the images, the total images, you notice that they might be slightly, the size might be slightly larger than, than the file used to extract the, the frames per second because it turns out that the so-called codecs or the software that, that uh, encode this video, used to encode this video, will apply some sort of compression techniques. The video has to be compressed. It's the thing we call video has to be compressed because the original size is so large, it combines the frames, the total number of frames, and the sound. So the size associated with the sound and the cumulative total of the images will, will, will comprise of the theoretical size of the image. So that has to be compressed uh, before the so-called uh, MKV file can be created or an MP4 file can be created. Do you understand this? Right, so this is what I was talking about. I mean, typically, the so-called video data is created um, by, by making use of a technique that combines like a video container. So the container will, will, will have the, the frames that are going to make up the video, the metadata. If you have subtitles associated with the video, the subtitles will be dumped into the container, and then there's the audio as well. Uh, and typically, most of these different video formats, will, will, they use a similar technique, but maybe the compression algorithms that they use might be different which is why you have like result in different sizes, right? Um, if you're curious about this, I mean, we're not really concerned with the nitty gritty details of how these different video formats actually function, but I, I would encourage you to go and read up on these things, because there's interesting stuff out there. So go read up on how maybe uh, Matroska or M M MKV uh, creates these so-called uh, containers, or implements the containers, how 
uh, the dot three GP that you normally use on your mobile devices, how these are created, right? I don't know if people have experimented with creating uh, animated GIFs here, where you get, if, like if you're creating memes, you can create some, some sort of like, a, it's like a video, but without sound, it's a GIF file, right? Yeah? Yes. Um, yeah, so these are things you want to experiment with. But there's more, right? There's a, a whole bunch of other video formats, you know? Some of them proprietary, some of them that are like open out there. Right, so the, res the resolution question here, I mean, you typically find these things, uh, oh, this video is a uh, full HD 720p, like why, right? Or 480p or 360p. Like I said, it just tells you the number of pixels. Um, and usually if you know the ratio, you can, if you know the ratio, you can determine the, the number of pixels that are going to be laid out horizontally. Because the number, before the P tells you the number of vertical pixels. 720p means there's 720 pixels horizontally. And then if you're using 16 to 9 as aspect ratio, you can derive this. Did I have anything? I don't have anything. You can derive this by just saying, uh, oh, 720, um, 16 to 9. So I'll just divide, I guess. I'm going to divide 9 into this. So it's 80, right? So I'll just multiply 720 by by 80 to, no, no, what am I doing? I'm doing something wrong here. If we have 720, and we're using a 16 to nine aspect ratio, I'm trying to find the greatest divisor here. 720 divided by, by nine, this times 16, yeah? Um, so if I have a 720, if I, if, if I have a 720p uh, file on YouTube, I know that the corresponding number of pixels that are going to be laid out horizontally, 1,280 pixels. And then I can, I can compute the total number of pixels um, associated with that video. Do you understand this? Yes. yes. When, you, when you're using a phone, right, and then maybe you're using 720 pixels. And I hope no one is do, using that using bundles. Yes, okay, I don't know what you're talking Yeah, yeah, but I'm... But yes. yeah. It's the same quality. It's still going to cover 700. It's the same quality, but the thing is, uh, you see, when you're viewing something on a much larger screen, the, you want to probably use high quality because the, the, the thing is going to pixelate, right? So if you, and let's not use 720, let's use 144p. Watching a 144p video in, watching a 144p video on a phone is fine, you can get away with it, but where's 144p here? I extracted all of them. I got one four. can anybody see 144p? I'm blind, I can't. There is 144p. Uh, let's go to a part where, have you noticed the, what's happening here? It's, yeah, it's, the, it's not, the quality is not that good, but if you are to watch the same video on your phone, you, you'd probably be able to see much clearer than you are seeing right now, right? Why? Yeah, because the screen is much smaller, right? Yeah, so in fact, that, that brings us to another discussion on the different resolutions. The different resolutions are, are there to take into account the fact that different devices are consuming the same media, right? If you are consuming the video using a computer, you probably want to download a much higher resolution. If you're using a phone, you can get away with maybe 360p, which is what I do most of the time, 280p or something. But observe, the same file, but using 4K, uh, which is, and I'll just, uh, I'll just order this by size because I know 4K is gonna be much larger, which is this. Or I'll just go to 1080p. Notice that uh, the video is at least clearer than the 144p. We are watching this the same video, but different quality. Yeah. Yeah, this is much clearer than it was before. So these are things you want to think about as you are using various types of um, resolutions associated with the video, you know. So when you're downloading these screencasts that we dump, we haven't dumped them in a while now, ask yourself, is quality important? If it is, I mean, you can just download full HD, right? Uh, just use a free UNSA network, EduRom, download them. 
and then go view them offline on your phone, right? Right, I mean, so these are some of the, I guess, the factors that you might want to take into account when you want to decide uh, which sort of resolution you want to use. So bandwidth cost, like we said. If, if you bought bundles using Xamtel, right, uh, you want to make sure that you, you, you use them carefully, right? So you, you want to consume, you want, you, you want to make sure there's a balance between the quality and, and the resolution, or the total size of the file, because the resolution dictates the size. Uh, what I've found myself when it comes to resolution is for me, for my eyes at least, 360p is perfect for me. The quality is not that compromised, right? Sometimes when I have uh, less bundles or less money allocated to buying bundles, what I'll do is I'll dumb it down to maybe 280. It works just fine uh, because most of the video I consume, I guess I'm interested in the sound, right? So quality is not really so much of an issue. Um, Sorry? Yeah. Yes. No, they, well, they're, they're colorated, but they're not the same. Okay, the resolution dictates the quality, so yeah, you could say they're the same. Um, yeah, so you also want to take into account the, 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 the amount of time you have to download this. So if you're on a much slower network, right? If the user network is so slow, it would be dumb for you to download, to, to go and watch a video file in 720p. Why? Because it's going to take longer for you to watch the entire video. Instead, you just want to dumb it down to maybe 240p or 360p, so that it takes less time to view the video. Fewer bits are associated with low resolution video. Right? And also, I want to take into account the device being used. If you're using a computer, obviously, you probably want to watch a much higher you know, uh, quality video, a video with a higher resolution. Um, and I mean, I was just saying here, uh, I mean, reasons why you might want to use one resolution over the other. I guess for most people, it's like ignorance. They just go on YouTube, you just think, I'm, I'm gonna go on YouTube and just watch the video. And then before you know it, because the way YouTube works is, sometimes it automatically, it automatically gives you a resolution based on the speed of your network. So if you're on a much faster network, you notice that you'd be watching, by default, you'd probably be watching a 720p video, right? If you're in a much slower network, it would dumb it down because it knows it's a slower network and it wants to send you this uh, video in the shortest period of time, so it would dumb it down. But some people probably don't know and you're just there uh, watching in full HD, 1080, right, 1080p. And then before you know it, you're calling Airtel. What happened to my bundles? Well, I mean, the, the bundles, you, yeah, this is what happens, right? The people do that. Uh, and really, look at this. Um, is there a part where I'm, look at the sizes. Uh, full HD, a one minute, 39 second long video is 200 megabytes in size. Right, I mean, why would you want to watch, why would you want to watch this video in 4K if you have less money for bundles? I don't know how much a bundle is now, but but this is a lot of my, well, I guess, it is a lot of money actually. Sorry? Oh, this is five quarter, right? So the question you should ask yourself is, is it worth to watch a one minute, 39 second, should I spend 13, three quarter, five quarter on a one minute, 39 second video? If you have the money, then it's fine, I guess. But yeah, yeah why, why not? Yeah, yeah, well, I guess, it depends, right? I mean, so here's the thing, if, you, if this is part of your job, no, this is serious, if this is part of your job, right? If, if this is part of your job and you're making money by, by watching high quality videos, you might as well invest in high quality videos, right? Because maybe it's going to pay itself back somehow. But anyway, um, and, and also I thought I would link this to some of the things that we discussed a while back. You can compute how long a video is, is going to be sent to your phone, how long it's going to take for you to download the video. If you know the speed and the resolution, right? So when I was downloading these different formats, um, I kind of like showcased uh, like the speed I was working with, right? The total size of the file and how long it took. So you notice the different file formats. I don't know what this file format, this is a 360p took uh, eight seconds to download. Um, this is, uh, I think this is a, this is a 4K, took three minutes, 41 seconds to download, right? So these are things to think about anyway. 
Um, and then if you're interested in kind of seeing, um, I mean, how the ones and zeros are represented, again, you can dump it using a, a hex dump a, a, a computer application software, an octeta here. Um, all right, if that makes sense, the question now is, yeah. Sorry? Yes. Does that mean that the one who showed that video um, had to go for the highest quality possible for shooting the video because it won't be done for like 1080p? Like 1080p. Is it like relative to the video taken for this year? Just like in general? Well, it, yeah, it's relative to that. It depends on the, the, the original device that was used to take the video, right? So, that, that video that we're using as an example was taken by this phone. I deliberately used 4K. By default, I don't shoot using 4K here. I have to go into advanced mode and change the settings and tell my phone to say I want to shoot this motion picture in 4K for whatever reason, right? Like, so if I'm in the business of creating, if I create video, videos, maybe music videos for a living and uh, I work with musicians and whatnot and I hope there are people in here that are going to do that because if you look at the, the quality of videos that we watch here, it's poor quality, terrible, right? They don't know how to do this. No, it's true, and the experts are going to come from here that are going to be doing the right things. Um, so you, the, device, the device is going to dictate what sort of resolution is going to be used. But it's up to you as an individual. If I'm, if I'm uploading that file to YouTube, for instance, when I was uploading to YouTube, I decided to upload it in 4K. But if, if I didn't have enough bandwidth to upload the 4K, I could have dumbed it down to make maybe 720 and uploaded the 720 um, file format. So what happens is the, the type of resolution that you upload to a, a platform like YouTube is dependent on you, the person taking the video footage, and the device that you're using. If it's capable of taking 4K video, then you have access to 4K which you can upload to YouTube. And then what YouTube will do is it will derive from 4K the other formats. Have you noticed that there are certain videos on YouTube where you don't have access to full HD? Maybe the highest resolution you have access to is 320p. If you have an old phone that is incapable of taking 4K, there's no way you can move up from, from a lower resolution to a higher resolution, right? Okay, so if that makes sense now, the question is how then do we encode sound? If there are no questions about video, right? We, we looked at text and whatnot, the question now is sound, right? How, how do we get to encode sound? It turns out really it's the same physics we did uh, grade seven, I think. <laughs> sound waves. <laughs> Excuse me, this is not a joke, right? When did we discuss sound waves in, in science? Okay, fine, in grade nine. Yeah, grade seven, grade nine. So it turns out, right, that sound is nothing more than, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we just discuss sound. Either. Sound is nothing more than a series of, uh, of vibrations in the air. So yeah, when you're listening to light on speak, right, it turns out that, uh, you know, there's going to be like changes in atmospheric pressure because of the sound vibrations that I'm producing, and then the changes in atmospheric pressure are going to hit your eardrums, and then you listen to the sound, right? The same, the same kind of technique is used by a computer, right? But you notice that when we're working with a computer, there's two things that we have to do. There has to be a way in which we are going to convert the sound waves into digital format. And then there has to be a way in which we're going to convert the digital format that we've stored onto the computer to sound waves so that we listen to it later on, right? Yeah? Um, and so this is why you have microphones. I use this microphone because it simulates like the eardrum, right? So what's happening behind the scenes is um, it's dictating the, or it's, it's taking into account the changes in atmospheric pressure. Those things, uh, the microphone converts the sound waves into electric signals. The electric signals are going to be converted into digital form by what? By your sound card, right? So this thing is being connected here. There's a sound card, obviously, right? Um, the sound card has um, an analog to digital converter, right? So that it converts the analog or the electric signals into digital form. Once they are stored in digital form, the opposite has to happen. The digital, the digital uh, data that we have has to pass through a DAC or a digital to analog converter, DSE. 
right? And then the, 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 the converted, the digital to analog converter sends the output to the speaker, right? The speaker converts the electric signals into sound, and then we're able to listen to that, right? So this is how sound works superficially. But it turns out that uh, the, the number of things that are happening behind the scenes here. So um, when, when the, the analog signal is being converted into, so it's like an example of an analog signal here, right? Um, because, because it's a continuous stream, as we are talking, we could use recording this thing, right? You notice that it's a, it's a continuous, these so-called vibrations are continuous, right? Normally sound is represented using this sine wave, right? So there's a continuous stream of, of data that's being passed to, into the microphone. And it turns out for us to, or for the analog to, to digital converter to actually work, it takes into account two things, right? It takes into account, um, um, the rate at which we are, we, are, we are taking note of the electric signals, right? Which is, uh, I guess, what's referred to as sampling, right? Um, and then it, it also takes into account uh, what they call quantization. So how often or, or, or how, much, how much of this quantity we're able to get, the electric signal? Do you understand? The sound is being converted into digital form. So the conversion, converting to digital form means that we have to associate numbers that are going to be interpreted by the computer. The numbers that we're able to associate to this sine wave, these numbers here, are dictated by the bit depth, similar to the way color depth works. So meaning that if, um, if we're using uh, a bit depth of uh, four, for instance, or eight, means that the different values that we're able to use to quantize this digital sound here are going to be what? Two to the power eight different values. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay, so you notice that, so two things that we're taking into account, sampling rate and bit depth, right? Um, and typically this is what you see here. Uh, so the sampling, the sampling rate usually will, will, will tell you to say, um, in a, in a given second, in a, in a given second, take X number of values. Let's say assuming we had a sampling rate of uh, 20, for instance, as an example, 20 hertz. It means that within a second, we are going to get these different, uh, how many values? 20 values of, of, of these uh, quantized values here, right? 20 of them. So you notice that the higher the, the higher the, the uh, sampling rate, the more clear the sound is going to be. Because you're getting more of these values. Yeah? And the reason you're getting these values is because at some stage, you see, you, you, you get these values at some stage, what you're doing with the, with the digital to analog converter is you're reconstructing this sound wave using the values that you are taking. But you realize that the Reconstruction is, going, is not going to be 100% the same as the original sound wave. Why? Because you're not, this is a continuous stream of information. You're not getting all the continuous stream of information. It's just bits and pieces of this. So when you reconstruct it, and in fact, if you look at literature, sometimes the reconstruction will be represented as what? Let's say you have these things that you're using to reconstruct. It will be represented as something like this, right? Like it's, it's not an, although this is not the correct way of representing a sound wave, but, but it's not going to be the same as the original sound wave. Do you understand? Right? Um, oh. oh. We have one. Oh. Okay, okay we'll, can we finish off sound uh, Monday, right? We'll finish off sound and then um, and look at compression. Or maybe we can continue and finish. Oh, I thought people were... Look, Oh, but we never have class though. Okay, uh, the, this is strange. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, now I don't know if there were. We're not having class this Saturday. No, there's no class. We we did all the makeup. Well, we can have class if you want to. No. Don't have time. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> do you want revision? We can do revision on Wednesday if you want revision, right? Yeah, on Wednesday or Monday or something. But what revision do you want? We've done, it's number systems and this is what we did.